So when the patients are managed conservatively, the things may not work out, and then we have to be doing a reconstructive or revisional surgery. And it's quite all right to try this conservative therapy, but when the time comes, then it's time to proceed with a reconstructive surgery. Currently, we have over 500 uh, patients experience with that over 80 to 85 uh, percent of success rates with good results and uh, outcome. And, uh, you know, I'd like to share you with some of the videos for these things and then to go through uh, what are the things that uh, we do think at the time of surgery to handling these uh, complicated uh, problems. All right. So let's go through these things. The first, you know, the three to four minutes is about the slides, nothing to disclose. Let's be aware of the fact that most of the patients after the JPOW surgery do well. But as was articulated by everybody here, it's a high morbid procedure and it needs a significantly involvement for an expert specialist as our gastroenterology colleagues and also from the surgeons. So, Complications commonly leading to reoperative or reconstructive pouch surgery, number one, is technical, and that is related to the leak. Sometimes we may have the issues related to the tip of the J pouch leak, efferent limb syndrome, others. When it comes to functional, it's the efferent limb syndrome. Efferent limb is what was articulated by Professor Pemberton. The part coming into the pouch is being dilated and creating a closed loop obstruction or creating a dead man's curve, the things are not going well. Lastly, the Crohn's disease. But most of it, I'm going to talk, focus on the technical, the IPA leak, and some of the other pathologies that uh, we have to deal with. Now, to refer or not to refer, redo pouch surgery is number one, is technically demanding. For that reason, I have no problem for some of these aggressive conservative managers, man, man, you know, the managements to be done under experienced hands like Professor Shen. It's time consuming. It requires a personal and institutional resource that are not available to all. Is your surgeon capable of to be able to do a S pouch when the J pouch is not feasible? If the patient is interested for a content ileostomy, if the surgeon is available to do that, content ileostomy is the patient do not have to carry a bag and they have to put the tube three to four times a day to empty their pouch. It needs an experienced radiologist, pathologist, and specifically gastroenterologist dedicated to the diagnosis and manage management of these problems. So after the conservative therapy, the leak has not healed. It come to a small point, and the conservative management of these patients has failed. So what we need to realize is the fact that this chronic presacral abscess or sinus is a technical complication. But the symptoms can be very confused and blamed at Crohn's or severe pouchitis. I had a patient, which I'm going to show, actually, uh, from Northern California, that the patient was given as a bipolar diagnosis because of this unrecognized problem that was going on for a long time. And the patient can present with this problem. Number one. Be humble. Patient must feel that, that you're there for them. Set reasonable expectations about what the goals are. We cannot give what the Lord gave them before they got sick. So they need to understand the fact that their quality of life is going to be better, but it's going to be never be the same before they got sick. This is specifically the fact that the things may not work out. They may have to end up with a permanent bag. They may have to have a suboptimal function. And this can be a very lengthy process. Overall, it took me nine months in the minimum to be able to redo or a salvage a pouch when a patient needs a redo J pouch procedure. Careful history is very critical. Obtain operative notes, pathology review from the other institutions, and assess and document the function. The routine that we'd like to do in our pouch center is when these patients come, exam under anesthesia, pouchoscopy, Gastrographic enema and MRI is very critical, specifically finding occult sinuses or fistulas that cannot be picked up by exam under anesthesia, <coughs> pouchoscopy, or enema itself. So that may give you some all these pathologies that is outlined on this slide as a cause of the problem. So the other thing is this commonly happened, unfortunately, uh, you know, the surgical community, patient gets a pouch, gets a problem, 
the thing seems to be healed up, ileostomy gets closed, patient develops these problems related to the leak, sepsis, fistula, disease converted to Crohn's disease, it's not me. You take over, give it to gastroenterology colleague. And that's very unfair, and that's the reason us completing each other is very critical to know and to watch and to follow our footsteps. What I tell to my patients and get into a really FBI type of questions, what happened? When did the issue happen? If the issue started within a year of the original pouch surgery, it is very unlikely it's a Crohn's disease. But as what Professor Pemberton articulated, the issues happened on a normally functioning patient a year or two after or more, and the issues happened, that is probably high likely a brewing Crohn's disease. That's a very important you know, separation to make to pursue this thing. So why? Because 80% of the time these patients that are sent to us as a Crohn's disease, we were able to salvage their pouches and the things did rotate the fact that they were able to keep their pouches for the long term. The functioning ileostomy is very critical in these patients when they come. They are drained mentally. They are drained psychologically. So I tell them, let's get a time out. I think it's important to give them an initial ileostomy without doing any revisional surgery. It cools off the sepsis. It buys time. It improves quality of life. It detoxifies the patients, allows the patient to regain health, and they're ready. Okay, let's take it on six months later. I'm ready. I'm mentally ready. I'm psychologically ready. I'm ready to do the redo surgery. And it sets the stage for the successful redo procedure. And it's important to work from the areas when you do this thing, be prepared, sleep well, get the help you need, and then work from the areas of the clear anatomy towards the those are distorted. I tell to my fellows and renders, known to unknown. Circle the enemy. Don't pick a fight with the biggest problem. Circle it and always have an exit strategy. If there's a leak, you're going to fix the leak. Most of the time, or 99% of the time, you have to do a hands-on anastomosis to fix that problem, and you do the pouch advancement. Don't throw the old pouch away because 70% of the time you can use that old pouch to make the things better and make a new anastomosis. Always have an exit plan. The last thing you want to do is to get into a war zone without an exit plan. That's a disarm or disarm to our patients. So this is what needs to be done. The things needs to be excised. The pouch needs to be connected. The chronically infected cavity has to be debrided. This is one of my patients with a chronic infected cavity that had to be debrided out. This is the patient that I was referring to from uh, Northern uh, California. This is the foot of the patient. This is the top. Significant amount of inflammation. Can you do that for me, or you want me to do that, David? So what the idea behind the redo pouch surgery is that you have the sinus that can be a small to a long one, and you need to excise this debris, disconnect the pouch, and after disconnecting the pouch, you know, the, you clean up this area of the chronically infected area and make a new pouch anastomosis itself. I think this is very important. By this way, you establish the gastrointestinal continuity. If you don't do that, the things are going to fail. You're just going to put the pouch back to the infected territory. That is very important to be able to do that, excise that chronic infected cavity. This is that patient, again, that excises the chronically infected cavity you know, the, and removing this dirty, pussy tissues, and then remove that thing, because that will allow the things to work for the patient to be reconnecting and work well. Sometimes you're going to get into trouble, and you have to take the risk on behalf of the patient to do the things. Otherwise, doing it in a health way is not a solution to their problem. Tip of the j pouch leaks that has been talked about, these things do not heal unless Dr. Shen addresses his way, or surgically, don't expect a spontaneous heal. Let's pass these things because we talked about and go to the videos itself. So the reoperative pouch surgery, it's technically demanding, can be done safely with good results, and we have over approximately 80 to 85 percent success over 500 patients throughout the country and the world. And keys to successful outcomes, communication, successful patient selection, patient counseling, and working and acting as a unit. So in the next 12 minutes that I have that I'll be talking to you and showing you about these videos. Let's go with this one, David. I'm going to voice this one. This is a patient that was referred, and patient was from Midwest area. Patient had a chronically bowel obstruction. The pouch was twisted. 
Patient also had an ileal pouch, anal ansma restricted. So this is the area where the pouch meso is. Look how the pouch was twisted. My assistant is rotating the things. And then this is the back of the pouch where this should have been in the front. Sometimes the laparoscopy, unfortunately, can create these problems we may not realize. This patient suffered for two years with this problem, with a chronic bowel obstruction, and the pouch was still dilated, as can be seen here. So we are emptying the pouch after cleaning the pouch. Now we're excising that stricture to be able to do a hands-on anastomosis. I think where it's this the mucosectomy, similar to what uh, Professor Flechner has shown. It's a hands-on anastomosis we do. We put these sutures in there, and then we bring the pouch to be able to do the anastomosis. In this case, patient didn't have a chance to have another pouch, so I had to use the old one, which I prefer in any way. But I was a little bit borderline con con concerned that the pouch was too big. So this is the eight sutures we put. This is the it most, th this took me a while to learn this thing. This, it's so critical because if you pull too much from the bottom, and the, you're, I'm trying to deliver the pouch to the anus, you rip it off, it's end of the case, you're telling this patient you have to end up with a permanent back for the rest of your life. So this is the part I do it personally. That Babcock bring it down, and then the sutures that we placed, you're parachuting that sutures up to that pouch and making that anastomosis. Uh, again, it's a teamwork. Uh, it is uh, very important to further subspecialize in this area to give the best chance for these uh, patients, and we're putting those sutures back. By this way, this was a twisted pouch, as was emphasized, and uh, can be seen here. Uh, this patient will have an ileostomy closed in three months' time. Uh, this one, please, David. And this is the tip of the J pouch leak, and this one has a voice, David, please. Thank you. We're going to pass from a Turkish-American accent to the Australian accent. After failing medical therapy, he underwent a two-stage open J pouch approximately three years ago at an outside hospital and initially had an uncomplicated post-operative course. His ileostomy was taken down at four months, but he soon developed back pain. This was initially thought to be sacroiliitis, for which he was treated with further immunosuppression. Subsequently, You okay, David? Let's restart again. Start again, please. Just start. Play. Thank you. S1 up to L4. CT guided aspiration revealed an E. coli. He was then referred to the Cleveland Clinic for further management, including consideration of a redo to J pouch. And when initially seen, the source of his pelvic sepsis was not clear. After evaluation at the clinic, the initial management strategy was to refashion his diverting loop ileostomy and wait six months to allow the pelvic sepsis to settle. He was then scheduled for a revision procedure, and when taken to the OR, he was placed in a modified lobotomy position with preoperative antibiotics and heparin. Bilateral ureter extension was inserted to allow identification of the ureters and a sharp adhesiolysis and full mobilization of the small bowel was performed, including takedown of the existing ileostomy. The afferent limb was identified, and you can see here the um, pouch uh, demonstrated in the middle, fully mobilized, and it was noted to be rotated almost 180 degrees. The afferent limb uh, here is demonstrated sitting on the right uh, of the right side of the pelvis, and after mobilization, the source of the pelvic sepsis was clear. Here we see the tip of J-leak uh, demonstrated using a tonsil. So this was plastered to the bone. And here we see a demonstration of the original uh, pouch configuration with the tip of J firmly adherent to the presacral tissues and the obvious cause of the both back pain and pelvic sepsis. Consideration was given to a revision uh, pouch, however, due to reach issues, it was felt best to repair the uh, tip of J leak. And here we see this being accomplished with a transverse uh, restapling of the uh, tip of J. This staple line was subsequently oversewn with a 3 ovicral suture.
And here we see the completed repaired pouch. This was very tough. Yeah. The integrity of the repair was then tested with a leak test. This is performed by instilling the peritoneal cavity with warm saline and then performing a flexible pouchoscopy. The afferent limb is occluded, as you can see on the left, and insufflation of the pouch uh, demonstrates no air leak. What is uh, demonstrated is some deserosalization of the anterior aspect of the pouch, which was the area that was uh, very adherent to the presacral tissue. This was subsequently repaired with some interrupted triovicral sutures. An ileostomy was refashioned and subsequently the patient recovered well with a plan for ileostomy takedown in three months after further imaging studies to confirm adequate healing of the tip of J repair. This case is a good demonstration of, demonstration of the sometimes occult nature of tip of J leaks. Let's go to the next uh, video, please, David. Thank you so much. Now, this next one is like, sometimes you don't know what you're going to get in life, and this is one of those circumstances, and we're going to pass to an Irish accent now from an Australian accent. Complex reoperative ileoanal J pouch from the Department of Colorectal Surgery in the Cleveland Clinic. This is a 25-year-old male patient with a background history of ulcerative colitis for which he underwent a total colectomy with ileoanal pouch anastomosis in 2005. Earlier this year, he presented to the local emergency room with obstruction and underwent an exploratory laparotomy with lysis of adhesions, small bowel resection, and an end ileostomy. His workup in our outpatients included an examination under anesthetic and a gastrograph and enema. The gastrograph and enema shows a small blind ending pouch and the examination under anesthetic showed a fibrotic non-dissensible pouch. At surgery, the ileoanal pouch was found to still be in position in the pelvis. However, unfortunately, it had been completely cut off from the small bowel mesentery during the division of the small bowel in his previous surgery. The pouch was excised from the pelvis and the omentum which was adherent to it was divided. As a new pouch needed to be created, a loop of small bowel was identified which would extend towards the pelvis. In order to increase the length of mesentery, a number of procedures are performed. Any excess mesentery is excised with transillumination of the mesentery to ensure that the vasculature to the pouch is not damaged in any way. He's very close to the SMA there. In addition, there. releasing cuts are made transversely across the peritoneum of the mesentery. It is very important with these that the peritoneum alone is incised and not the mesentery. This is over A the sperm mesenteric artery itself. The enterotomy is then created to facilitate the anastomosis and using this enterotomy, two arms of a 100 millimeter linear handheld stapler are placed to form the pouch. We had to make a new During one on this, this case. firing of the stapler, it is essential to ensure that the mesentery of the small intestine is not involved at any stage. We use two firings of a 100 millimeter handheld stapler to eventually create a 200 millimeter in length ileal J pouch. Again, with the second firing, it's important to ensure that the mesentery is protected. Once this has been fired, excess ileum from the efferent limb is then cross-stapled and removed. The staple line is examined for pulsatile arterial bleeding, which is clearly evident here. In addition, using the enterotomy, the interior of the pouch, particularly the staple line, is also examined for hemostasis. 
as this should be addressed prior to any anastomosis. Finally, the integrity of the newly formed pouch is assessed by repetitive injections with air and normal saline to assess for a leak. Once yeah. again, reach is assessed prior to passing the newly created pouch on a long babcock down towards the anal canal where a hand-sewn pouch anal anastomosis will be created. While doing this, it is very important to do this as a bimanual procedure, ensuring that the pouch is not passed under tension and is not damaged during its passage to the anal canal. One can also ensure at this time the normal alignment of the mesentery and the small intestine. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.